This video was brought to you by Brilliant. Hello friends, my name is JJ and here is a question. How culturally important are video games? They've been around for over 40 years now and yet in some ways it still feels like we haven't quite worked out an answer. So as longtime viewers of this channel know, I am very interested in questions of culture, particularly the culture of this continent and the quest to define it. And it is obviously impossible to talk about American culture without talking about entertainment, given the enormous role that movies, TV shows, books, and music play in daily life over here. Now, maybe I am a bit naive, but I have always thought of video games as being a rather small part of American entertainment culture when compared to the other stuff. A niche hobby enjoyed by a minority of the population, and thus something with only a minimal influence on American culture overall. But the other day I read a statistic in the New York Times that shook me to my very core in a story about the proposed merger of Microsoft and Activision Blizzard, two of America's biggest video game companies, the Times threw out this striking fact. The game industry now accounts for significant chunks of the economy. It is larger than music, US book publishing, and North American sports combined. Microsoft's game division and Activision Blizzard each make more money annually than all US movie theaters. Now that is astonishing. Let me just repeat that again with some on-screen graphics to really drive the point home. Video games are allegedly a bigger chunk of the American entertainment economy Economy than recorded music, book publishing, and professional sports combined. That said, I did attempt to double check these numbers, and I think that the times might be exaggerating just a tad. Even when I used the most conservative possible estimates from the American book publishing industry, recorded music industry, and big four sports leagues, the total always came out to over 60 billion, while the US video game industry claims to have only pulled in 56.6 billion, including the sale of consoles and accessories. I suppose it is possible that the Times is adding some additional source of revenue to the gaming tally to fill this multi-billion dollar gap, but I couldn't think of anything. It is true, however, that games are way bigger than movies. According to Comscore, North America's box office revenues only totaled $7.35 billion in 2022, which to be fair, does reflect the lingering legacy of the pandemic, which sharply cut box office revenues from 2020 onwards. But even then, Microsoft games alone brought in over $16 billion last year, which is more than the entire American movie industry was making even pre-pandemic. So in conclusion, even if American gaming revenues might not entirely surpass all of this other stuff, they're still pretty close. At the very least, they certainly seem to be the single biggest faction of the American entertainment industry at present, with their closest rival video on-demand streaming services trailing by a fair bit. So yeah, pretty big shock. And the reason why this is interesting to me is because I really do not feel like the other institutions of mainstream American culture reflect the power and popularity that video games hold in modern American society. I mean, sure, some video games are merchandised up the wazoo, and in recent years, movies and TV shows based on video games seem to be finally achieving some degree of popular and critical acclaim. And in any given year, some of the best-selling games in America involve American professional sports, suggesting some cultural synergy there. But as far as deeper cultural attention goes, I feel like knowledge of video games is just not particularly valued as an important form of American cultural literacy when compared to knowledge of other forms of American entertainment. There is no mention of video games at all in this dictionary of American cultural literacy, for instance. MASH and Monty Python get mentioned though. Or let us compare how often various major American publications known for their cultural analysis talk about popular video game franchises in contrast to some other popular entertainment thing. Google informs me that the New York Times has written about the Netflix series Bridgerton 4,350 times, while they have only written about Call of Duty 
which is probably the single most popular video game franchise in the United States, 2,400 times. And a lot of that coverage was just in the context of business stories about the Microsoft Activision merger. The Atlantic has written about Dark Souls exactly four times, but the Green Bay Packers 306 times. The New Yorker.com has 417 articles mentioning Lil Nas X, but just 43 that reference Mario Kart. In short, within the world of elite level American cultural commentary, thinking and talking about sports, pop music, movies, television, and novels is commonplace, but video games considerably less so. And why is this? Why does literally the most popular form of American entertainment often seem like it's struggling to get the same level of cultural credit as the other stuff? Well, I have a few theories. But before we get to those, let us just hear a brief word from today's video sponsor, Brilliant. Hello friends, so if you are watching this video, you are clearly somebody who likes acquiring knowledge for its own sake, but one cannot get a complete education from weird Canadian YouTubers alone, and that is where our friendly friends at Brilliant come in. Brilliant is an online learning platform offering hundreds of interactive courses on a wide variety of important topics with lessons running the gamut from beginner to pro. Their main focus is on the so-called STEM topics, with courses on all of the important stuff that everybody is scrambling to get a handle on these days in this big scary world of ours, including quantum computing, coding, blockchain, and everyone's favorite, AI. My pals over at TLDR News were recently pushing Brilliant's course on hypothesis testing, which is one of those things that everyone should have at least some basic understanding of, given how many wild claims of cause and effect are being made about everything these days, especially in the realm of health and medicine. So I gave it a try, and I must say it was pretty good. Like most brilliant courses, it offered a mix of clear and well-written lessons, interactive assignments, a natural challenge curve, and a fun and engaging presentation with more than a touch of whimsy and humor. So if this sounds like the sort of thing that you would be into, and why wouldn't it be, why not give a click to the link in the thing below and visit brilliant.org slash j Today, your first 30 days are free, and the first 200 of you who sign up get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Brilliant. Learn to think. Okay, so theory number one about why video games do not seem to hold the same cultural cachet as other forms of American entertainment is just that they are new. I mean, like I said earlier, video games have been around in some form for over four decades, but movies have been around for over 100 years and television for over 80. Pretty much every American currently living was born into a world where TVs and movies already existed, to say nothing of literature and sports and music, whereas modern video games were basically invented and rose to their current level of popularity entirely within my lifetime. And it takes time for anything to be taken seriously. Movie criticism, as a specific form of intellectual commentary found in sophisticated newspapers and magazines, only really took off in the 1930s or so, after motion pictures had been around for about three decades. Professionalized TV criticism is even more recent. The New Yorker, for instance, didn't hire its first television critic on until 1992, after TV had been around for nearly a half century. In both cases, the general view was that the medium had to mature before it was worthy of serious analysis from serious people. I mean, early movies and TV shows were considered extremely simple entertainment at best, and mindless schlock at worst. They were acknowledged to exist as a popular form of entertainment, but that was basically as much cultural credit as they got. And I think video games have followed a similar timeline. The technology has gotten so much better over the last decade or so, and this has allowed for the creation of much more complex and substantial games. And so it logically follows that we should only expect them to start receiving more serious cultural attention and cultural integration now. The previous few decades, by contrast, feel like gaming's equivalent of the silent movie or vaudeville era. Historically, video games have also likely suffered from a bit of a generational gap in terms of cultural perceptions that is only starting 
to be overcome as well. According to the Entertainment Software Association, the average American video game player is 32 and has been gaming for 21 years, meaning most of them started playing games as kids. Video games were, of course, heavily marketed to children in their early days, and this fostered a lot of disinterest in them on the part of the boomer generation. And that was probably pretty bad for gaming's respectability as a cultural force, given, until quite recently, American journalism and academia and the rest of the professional intelligentsia was so heavily boomer dominated. Cartoons would probably be a good analogy as well, given comics and animation were another medium that spent its first four decades or so of existence, primarily understood as a kid's thing, and only really saw its base start to broaden in the latter half of the 20th century. Video games' a second obstacle to deeper cultural appreciation might just be something a bit more fundamental and inescapable. Namely, that they're games. This was the argument that the famed movie critic Roger Ebert made when he controversially posited that a video game, unlike a movie, could never rise to the level of art. A video game, he said, has rules, points, objectives, and an outcome. A critic might cite an immersive game without points or rules, but I would say then it ceases to be a game and becomes a representation of a story, a novel, a play, a dance, a film. And I think this is basically correct. Games possess certain defining game-like qualities that put them in a different category from other forms of entertainment, simply because they are things that you play to win, which makes them inherently more linear and restrictive, and some might argue less interesting to analyze and appreciate. The reason why people get Pulitzers for reviewing movies and music but not video games, is probably the same reason no one has gotten a Pulitzer for reviewing a golf course. Games can try to be more like movies or novels or whatever, with rich plots and well-written characters. But, as Ebert says, if a game tries too hard to become art, it runs the risk of failing as a game and becoming something different. An interactive sensory experience, perhaps. I guess the larger conclusion would be that entertainment culture is basically split between entertainment you directly control, like toys and board games and video games and sports that you play, and entertainment that is basically a performance that someone else puts on for you, be it in the form of a book or a movie or an album or a sporting match that you watch. And the former is always doomed to be viewed as the slightly lower form of culture just because it entertains on a more self-indulgent level. Okay, now my third theory explaining the video game cultural appreciation gap would just be that I think for quite a long time, gamer culture has deliberately and consciously defined itself as something apart from the American cultural mainstream. In other words, video game enjoyers have been historically happy to embrace the idea that they are part of a subculture, with this behavior in turn probably helping isolate them from other entertainment enjoyers in the same way that video games' reputation as children's toys has. Now, the best evidence of this is probably just the fact that we even have that word, gamer, a word that only exists to isolate people who play video games. There is really no equivalent of this in other realms of entertainment culture. We don't have special terms for people who watch movies or sports or listen to music. These are all seen as unremarkable things that everybody does. Growing up in the 80s and 90s, I certainly remember video games getting branded with a bit of an outsider or even bad boy image. Part of this was because back in those days, video games were often accused of being morally bad. But it was also a choice that I think the video game industry made in terms of how they chose to market their games and to who, and the sort of people who wound up writing and editing the video game magazines and all of that. Games were a new technology that wasn't very well understood, but I think to a degree, they didn't want to be understood either, 
because this made them seem more special and cool. Deliberately subculturing yourself isn't unique to gamers, of course. Heavy metal, science fiction, D&D, &D, there are lots of examples of fans of a certain form of entertainment consciously trying to withdraw from the mainstream and finding the mainstream happy to return the favor. But of course, as the New York Times noted, today video games are very much the mainstream. According to the Entertainment Software Association, in fact, 65% of Americans play video games at least one hour a week, half of them women. Are these people all gamers? Or are they just tourists in someone else's subculture? I feel like this is one of the Difficult questions that people involved in running video game fan spaces are still trying to sort out. And obviously there has been a lot of controversies involving gamer gatekeeping and all of that. But I guess my point would just be that gaming did spend many decades thinking of itself as something that wasn't for everyone. And this has fostered a lot of stereotypes that are proving hard to shake. Even if the numbers now seem to contest this, a lot of people still seem to think that the appropriate place for video games in American culture is somewhere on the margins. And lastly, if video games do not seem as culturally influential as perhaps they should, I think one final reason is just that there are too many of them these days. According to this GameSpot list, for instance, there were around 400 games released in the US in 2022 alone, and that's not even counting games for the phone, which the ESA says is the most popular American gaming platform of them all. The sheer amount of video games available to play in the 2020s is a symptom of a broader challenge for American culture, that flows directly from the fact that we live in a time of such unprecedented material abundance and consumer choice. And that is that it is simply much harder for American culture in general to unite around and elevate specific cultural products than it used to be. This is sometimes referred to as the death of the monoculture, which is to say the phenomenon that if you put 10 random Americans in a room these days, they would probably all have wildly different tastes in music and movies and everything else, just because it has never been easier to only consume entertainment that meets your very precise personal preferences. Video game sales statistics are weirdly hard to come by, but based on what I've been able to research, a game is generally considered one of the year's best sellers on this continent if it sells somewhere around 15 million copies. And this means that video games, despite being bigger than movies, are also much more niche than movies, given that a successful movie will often sell well over 30 million tickets. That horrible CGI remake of The Lion King, for instance, sold over 59 million tickets in 2019, which is nearly 10 million more than Overwatch, which came out in 2016, has sold in its entire lifetime. And it's considered one of the most popular games in history. A successful game likewise reaches far fewer people than a successful song, like say, As It Was by Harry Styles, which was streamed over 558 million times in the US last year. Based on the numbers, I would say that a successful video game is really more akin to a successful TV show. For example, Yellowstone pulled in about as many average viewers last year as there were copies sold of God of War Ragnarok. And how often did you hear anyone talking about Yellowstone? For an entertainment medium to have a big presence in the mainstream cultural imagination, it needs a handful of extremely famous, highly recognizable figureheads who can embody that medium. Figures in terms of titles or characters or directors or stars. And I think we are just living in an age where there are far fewer mainstream figureheads of this sort in any entertainment medium, just because, like I said, the odds have never been higher that the thing that you like is completely unknown to people outside of your entertainment bubble. Like, I will just straight up admit that I had never heard of Elden Ring before I made this video. I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of the most universally familiar video games and video game characters tend to be so old as well. They're sort of a nostalgic relic of a time 
in which there were far fewer games and everyone played the same ones. Kind of like if I asked you to name a famous band, you might say the Beatles for the same reason. The harder it is to identify mass appeal culture in the present, the more anachronistic our cultural figureheads become. And that is all I got to say about video games. Hopefully you found some of these arguments insightful or persuasive. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Do not forget to check out Brilliant, and I will see you next week.